Hi everyone. Welcome and thank you for being here. As uh, I was reading Alan Watts this morning uh, when I do when I was doing my great morning, he said, "Be present, and this mo this present moment is pure miracle." So this is who this is who we are. This is where we are in this present moment, pure miracle. Now you are in Disrupt Everything podcast series. I'm Isra Garcia, I'm the host, I'm sometimes guide, sometimes learner, sometimes beginner. Well, most of the times beginner, you know, beginner. So today, as you guessed, uh, we have an episode and, it's, and I'm, as I'm talking in English, uh, this means it means that we have an international guest, a really, really special for me because I've been following his talks, his learnings, from his teachings. I would say from uh, from some months ago, before before COVID nineteen, I started to get interested on Zen philosophy. Uh, thanks to Alan, Alan Watts, which is just somebody like I resonate with a lot and uh, when uh, when the quarantine started here in Spain and also almost all over the world it, it was a real great occasion for studying Zen and, and at the same time I was studying also I was reading about the uh, Tao and Taoism um, almost every night between 15 and 21 and 28 minutes then I realized that um, I was connecting with the, I was connecting a lot with the first, with the, with the, with Zen. And meanwhile, I, I felt that, you know, it was not the moment for, for, for Taoism. Um, after a few days, I, I started with a really more serious immersion process with Zazen. And through books, articles, and most interestingly, videos and uh, interviews. There is where I met virtually Zen Master Daibon Sunim, which is my guest on our guest on Disrupt Everything podcast series. Thank you, welcome, and... Uh, we're blessed to have you here, Master, Master De Bonsunim. Well, thank you very much. And uh, it's a blessing for me, too. I feel like I'm in your office with you. It's a lovely <laughs> background there. <laughs> you are here in Valencia with us. I hope I'll, I'll, be, sh I'll be soon in Korea um, <laughs> meeting you in, uh, in Musangsa. Sure, sure. Thank you for, for having the time, for making the time, for being so so generous and gentle on the on the request and uh, we're here we are here with the uh, same master Debon Sunim in uh, what I call the middle way so <laughs> thank you and welcome to Disrupt Everything podcast series you're welcome it's great to be here hello to everyone who's uh, somewhere in the world listening to this Debon Sunim is a university, gradu a university graduated with a degree in psychology in uh, 1972. He worked five years as a counselor in a university psychiatric in hospital in, and uh, also in prison. And uh, he moved into the Pre Providence Center in the U.S. in 1984, studying with same master. Sheng, Sheng Shan, right? Did I write, did I say properly? Sung San. Sung San. Sung San. Sung San. After practicing seven years, he was ordained as a, a Buddhist monk. And after more training and practice, uh, Zen Master Sung San made the Debong Sunim the abbot of Zen centers in Paris, France, and in Berkeley, California, and also in Cambridge, Massachusetts, in the United States. Zen Master Daimbong Sunim has lived and trained in meditation centers 
and temples in the US and Europe and Asia for 39 years. And in 1992, he received Inca authorization, authorization to teach. And in 1999, transmission from Zen Master Seng San. Song San, sorry. He, he has traveled extensively through the, the world teaching Zen. Currently, Zen Master Dan Bong, he's the heat spiritual teacher at Musangsa in Jeroin, Mont, uh, Jeroin, Jeroin Mountain International Zen Center in South Korea. With such an extensive uh, curricula and, uh, and life experience, my, my first question and, uh, and also for, for welcoming in the, in the podcast and in this interview, my first question to you, uh, Master Dan Bon Sunim, is if you, were, if, you are, if you were about to put all your highlights, life highlights in a, in a timeline, what will be that? What will be that? Those highlights. Uh, biggest highlight would be uh, sitting here uh, in this beautiful office that you have digitally and talking to you. <laughs> That's the beginning <laughs> and the end of my whole life. <laughs> so, uh, thank you for for going through the birth pains of uh, making this moment happen. Uh, I. Briefly, I was born in 1950 in the United States, and uh, I had big questions when I was in primary school about why people make so much suffering for each other. I grew up in a big city and went to public school, so all kinds of people going together, and I certainly was aware of American uh, history and uh, white people's relationship with black people and World War II and all those things. And when I was 11, I happened to get chosen for a uh, international camp in Japan. And uh, there were kids from 10 different countries and we did the usual kids stuff, different sports and things, but they took us sightseeing and we went one point to Kamakura which has a huge outdoor Buddha. Um, if people have been there, they know it well. If not, they've probably seen pictures of it. That was the first time I ever saw or had even heard of Buddha. And I immediately got this deep feeling that this person, I don't know why, but this is how the statue affected me, uh, understood life why they're suffering, how it appears, how to take it away, and what our real purpose is. And then uh, I'd say uh, that stuck with me very deeply. Sometime, some years later, my brother told me a Zen story, and I started thinking about uh, Zen and getting interested, not in reading about Buddhism or Zen, but in meeting a real living teacher. And I kind of, I wanted to meet a teacher who was not hindered by culture, who could teach anybody anywhere. And that took some more time. Uh, when I ended up studying psychology, as you said, I worked in hospitals. I finally quit and decided that uh, I couldn't get wisdom through any more academic training. And... Uh, in 19, actually in 1977 was when I met Zen Master Sung San in America. And soon after I met him, uh, I felt that this is the teacher I'm looking for and I became a student. And I actually moved into the Zen Center at that time. Then in 1984, I decided to ordain and become a Buddhist monk, which left me free from family life so I could put all my energy into uh, Zen practice and also helping to make Zen centers where other people could come and go and practice. Uh, and that was, uh, yeah, 1984. And then at some point along the way, the Zen master uh, made me a teacher. And around 93, he asked me to come to uh, Korea and help him in Asia. He had spent most of the previous 20 years in America 
and also some time in Europe. But then around the early 90s, he started to spend more time back in Asia. So I've basically been uh, based here in Korea since 93. Then in 99, he uh, gave me a title and uh, uh, decided that we needed to build our own temple, our own international temple in Korea, because our style is mixing together men, women, monks and nuns, lay people with families. And uh, he realized that after he died, we would probably get pulled back the old traditional way without his influence, uh, which would separate men and women, etc., unless we have our own temple. So uh, basically, I've been here on this Korean mountainside for uh, most of the last 20 years, and we have a um, quite a functioning international Zen center with people from lots of different countries uh, coming and going. Some stay and ordain, uh, and that's what we're doing. Wow. So other than being in Valencia in your office, that's, that's the highlight. That's a, that's a good, that's a good journey. I, I hope, uh, I hope the, I feel it. And as I, as I, as soon as I can travel, I will go on, uh, I will go and spend some time, uh, in the mountains in Musangsa for sure. It's sure, just sure. 90, 90. Well, Sorry. I should tell you that we have a mountain place uh, in Spain that is a, about two hours north of Barcelona. And we have a Spanish woman and a man from Czech Republic who run the meditation center up there. So you, you don't even have to fly internationally to get a taste of it. It's true. Let me tell you that I really booked, uh, I already booked a retreat for September. Oh, excellent, excellent, and uh, hopefully, my first we'll see you soon. Then <laughs> my first Zen retreat in September, I will do it in a, a because somebody from your office was kind mm. kind enough to recommend me to look for retreats close to pa in Palma and Barcelona and also in Europe. Yeah. And then I found yeah. Barcelona, and then I saw that they were really active on retreats, and I booked yes, yes. I booked two, one for September and one for November. So, oh, wonderful. Uh, yeah. uh, That's the way to do it. Just start right out. And, uh, you know, because our teacher spent so much time in the West, uh, he encouraged students to make centers where people can come and practice. So we, we have quite a few uh, fairly funky, which I like. You don't want to be too, too organized. And, uh, but they uh, have very live practice. I like right? that one. Funky, yeah. Um, <laughs> What's the, what's the life of first becoming a Zen master and then what's the life of a Zen master? Well, what I would advise is when you wake up in the morning, uh, go to the bathroom. Then uh, wash your face and depending on what you have to do next, uh, get dressed. That's basically it. Uh, be <laughs> decent to people and have a big question and try to throw away uh, your ideas and uh, you know, dedicate yourself to wanting to understand my true nature and helping others in whatever form that happens according to your situation. And, so that's, a life, that's the life of a Zen master. <laughs> and what's the difference between the, la the actual life of, of a real master, uh, re uh, sorry, Zen master and a, the one from the one who is becoming or wants to become or or is starting in the same path that's a good question uh the difference is uh hungry time eat tired time sleep <laughs> <laughs> you know there's a famous zen master named majo from uh china about 1100 years ago and he was asked uh before enlightenment, after enlightenment, how are they different? He said, before enlightenment, sky is blue. After enlightenment, sky is blue. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you just have, uh, hopefully, some just increased confidence in, in your true nature, which any person, as they grow older and get experience, uh, if they keep a big question, 
whether it's in your marriage life or raising kids or working in the world, uh, gets wisdom, slowly gets wisdom. Uh, Zen tries to focus on that to um, uh, make it uh, hopefully uh, appear more readily, that's all. I was really interested in a, in a word that I've seen uh, I've seen in, in you uh, naming it in the in the videos. Uh, I'm now I'm now reading a book. At least I don't have the Superman pants right now, so maybe. Huh? Um, you look I great. Have, I have um, like a Katsuki Sekida about Sazen, and mm. and um, what's what. Because there is a lot of people that um, I think I don't know I don't have an opinion, which is I think is the best thing to do in this in this kind of matters. But a lot of people which uh, is uh, watching or listening this podcast just heard about Zen, you know, the playlist Zen escape Zen escapes, or you know, and people just understand Zen as some way of relaxing. So, what would you say? If I were to ask you, what is Zen? What it means Zen to you? Yeah, what it means Zen to you? And then how well, you explain <laughs> to somebody that doesn't know a thing about Zen? Sure, sure, sure. The wall behind you is black. <laughs> so Zen means clear, become clear. Usually we have our opinions, then opinions come from opposite thinking. So my opinion and your opinion are different and we fight each other. But if we put our opinions down, you can see this moment clearly. Then if you try to do that again and again and again, your mind starts to become clear and you can see how you create your own suffering. Then you begin to understand how suffering arises and you can see the suffering of others. Naturally, if you see the suffering of others, you also suffer. You know, even little kids do that. They see their mom suffering, then they also start crying or get upset, but they don't know maybe how to help the mom. So if as we grow and live, we're reflecting back on ourselves, we're paying attention, we can see clearly, we see our own experience and we begin to also understand the experiences of others and then we just want to help. So naturally compassion appears. So become clear and then live a life of compassion moment to moment. And it's quite natural if we're becoming aware. If we're not, then we just hold on to our patterns and our habits, which often involve uh, blaming others uh, for our own experience. And you can see that all the time in the world. The reason you do meditation is you begin to see how you do it yourself. So then, Zen means become clear and help others. Then in the becoming aware process is where the Zazen starts, right? The sitting and the meditation. Yeah, yeah. So we often say, you know, body sitting is important, but most important is mind sitting. How do you keep your mind moment to moment? So correct sitting meditation means a sitting time, just sit. You, you breathe in, you're aware you're breathing in. You breathe out, you're aware you're breathing out. That's all. Floor, whatever color. Your floor is gray. You no, know, my floor is brown. You see it clearly. That's all. But anybody who sits by themselves for even five minutes finds they start creating all these things in your mind, their mind. You know, like right now, I can hear this truck outside. It's spraying to stop mosquitoes. You know, <laughs> but people can really quickly get an opinion, and then they fight each other. But if you just see what's happening and also understand the root of suffering, then you're free to actually help others, not with your opinion. It's just, I don't know how to say it. It's like a mirror, it just naturally appears. And you can see little kids do it, but as we grow, we attach to many, many ideas. We don't do it anymore. 
And um, what is what is the link with the middle way? Because middle way means that uh, if you if you don't have opinion or you are empty, you are in the middle, right? Is it, what's the div, what's the explanation? Because this term fascinates me. When I heard you uh, from you the first time in the in a in a lecture you were giving. Hmm. Uh, the middle way is. Uh, not taking either extreme. You know, Buddha had this wonderful life. He was a prince. He was going to become a king. He didn't really even have to study in school. He's going to become the king. Everybody else has to study now so they can try and get a good job. You know? <laughs> so, but when he left home, then he started to do this very austere practicing. And after about a number of years, he realized with his willpower, he could deny his body so much that he would eventually just die. And that was too much. He wouldn't solve his problem of, is there a, a, a permanent thing in this world or not? Is there a permanent thing we call God or a permanent thing inside? All kinds of names for it. I, soul, spirit, and he'll just die. So then he began to eat a moderate amount. So it's finding the middle way, which is between the two extremes of indulgence and uh, you know, too austere. It also means most people, like an animal, attach to existence. But human beings get upset, get angry, and they want to disappear. They want to die. And they hope that in dying, everything ends and I won't suffer anymore. And so they're attached to annihilation. Most of the time we're attached to existence in an animal sense. So the middle way is not attaching to existence, not attaching to annihilation, not attaching to form, not attaching to emptiness. Would you, would you say that the, um, so in order to, to know the middle way, should we, should we, should we, be jumping from extreme to extreme to know how is life dancing in the edges? Because if not, how we can, how we can know where the balance or the middle way is? What are you doing right now? I ask you, what are you doing right now? I'm interviewing you. I'm asking yeah, you a question and I'm also recording a podcast. Yeah, you're sitting in a chair and you're interviewing me, asking me a question. And that's it. That's the middle way right there. You see very clearly. Okay. Okay. So really interesting. sometimes you have to do something that's uh, harder than you're used to. And then you find your middle way. Um, one time our teacher felt around 1980, the world's starting to change very fast. So he started to do more bowing. You know, there's a Buddhist practice of bowing. Mm -hmm. We usually do 108. It takes 10 or 15 minutes, but he wanted to tell his students to do more. So he started to do more. So he told us one day, so one day he gets up early and he does a thousand bows. And then after a few days, he gets up early and he does 1500 bows, which takes about, I don't know, uh, maybe three hours. And then he gets up early and he does 2000 bows. And then he gets up even earlier and he does 2500. And then he told us he decided too much. So he went back to 1,500. <laughs> so sometimes that's how you find the middle way. That's a really interesting. Um, I've been uh, recently, I've, I've done a 40, 40, 40 day of fasting, fasting. Mm. And, and I got clear, but, I, I, but perhaps 100 days will be too much, right? Exactly, exactly. So as you live your life, if you keep trying, you know, with a big open mind, you begin to find what we call the middle way. Mm. This is what I'm realizing because society is telling us, you know, advertising is telling us, have a balanced life. You know, the, the cereals, eh? Kellogg's, have a balanced life. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, like... Uh, but, uh, but, I, but my question to everybody when I do a speaking or when I do a workshop or when I do a like, massive event, 
I I always ask, <clears throat> how how can be how can be balanced if we don't know where our limitation or our biggest struggle can go and over but i'm not always saying go to the extreme or the 100 because sometimes mm. the other extremes is zero do nothing mm. you know be still mm. so mm. And, and, and so people are don't you think people are lost on finding a, a, a you know unreal balance which i understand sure yeah, it's not easy. This is why it's helpful to practice together with others. Because by following some schedule that somebody makes up, you begin to learn and doing it and pushing yourself, you can begin to find ultimately uh, your middle way. If you put down your opinion, you will find your middle way, definitely. And uh, many times that can mean in some situations, you have to try harder, and, but you can do it. So it's helpful to train together with others because it, you know, even an athlete does that. Most great athletes also have a coach, a trainer who yeah. watches them and gives them advice that they can't see themselves. So in Zen, we say important to have a teacher and very, very important. You, you develop faster if you don't only practice alone, practice with others. Then you know how to practice when you're alone. So that's why we, our teacher made meditation places where people could come and learn by practicing together. And then they can find uh, their way. And and is there a way, is there a way the I don't know mind? So because it's, this is the, the concept which, you know, it explodes my mind when I was, <laughs> because I, I, I don't know how many times I wrote it. I wrote it in, in my books because I wrote it, I wanted to wrote it so many times that I don't, I don't never forget that, you know, and um, mm. before, before, before listening from, the, this concept, they know, no, they don't know mine from you. I always say to my friends that I, I'm a, I'm a white belt mentality. So mm. I'm white belt because I'm, I never know, I never don't know anything, and I, I always want to start everything from the scratch because they mm. start from the scratch. So can you, can you elaborate more on the don't know, men, don't know mentality? Sure, sure. You know, I think everyone, most people, probably sometime around eight or nine years old, start to think to themselves, like, what is this? You know, in terms of this life, what, what is going on here? How did I get here? We get this question. And Buddha's main question was, what am I? We all have somewhere inside this idea of I, and it changes from time to time. But it's like, what am I? We say I every day. We think of it. I want this. I want that. I like this. I don't like that. What is this I? So the heart of Buddhist practice is reflecting back on yourself. What is this I? And what we say in Zen, Buddha realized he didn't know. And the story is he kept this don't know mind for six years through many, many experiences. One morning, saw the star, got enlightenment. So uh, the path of Buddhism is the path of don't know. What is don't know? <laughs> what am I? So many people will say to me, well, what is don't know? And I say, correct. When you ask that question, you don't know. <laughs> so we don't say I don't know, because we don't know I. Just don't know. You know, uh, maybe you're in a relationship and something's not going well. Now, one way is to have your opinion about it. I'm no good or they're no good or they do this and that's no good. That's wrong. or My mistake, something. But sometimes you just sit back and ask yourself, what's going on here? That's don't know mine. And all wisdom comes out of this don't know mine. 
We all were born with it. It's our original nature. You know, when you look at a baby, they're looking up at their hand, perhaps. They're looking at their hand. They don't even realize it's their hand, that it's connected to with them. And they really have this don't know mind. Like, what? What is that? They're not thinking in those words, but they have it. Because true don't know is before speech. It's just like, and when you keep that mind, you're taking in information. You're learning, 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 learning. And then something becomes clear. Then one day they realize it's my hand and I can use it. And then the question is, how do they use it? Do they use it to help somebody or do they use it to harm somebody? So the heart of Buddha, Buddhist practice and definitely the heart of Zen is asking, reflecting back on yourself, what am I? And if you realize you don't know, keeping this don't know mind. Then you see when you're hungry and you eat, not hungry. But many times we eat even when we're not hungry. <laughs> That's a problem. <laughs> so you begin to get wisdom about your own body and mind. And, and it comes quite naturally just by keeping this question. And when you, when you, when you are in the society that, because I got, I got to a point where I realized that the more I, the, the more I, the more I know, the, the less I, the less I know about myself, and, and, and I, so when I when I reflect on society ideals of what of you know know who you are, but but you, but you, you don't know, you you are nobody you so you are nothing, so so it is not a it's not a, like a trap, like because people think they know who we are, but they don't they not. We take in a lot of ideas from society, from our parents. That's not ours. That's somebody else's idea. If you don't digest it, you'll never believe in yourself. You'll never understand yourself. And, and society, I, I decided at some point in my life, society has no, uh, no wisdom that I can count on. So don't look for it there. Yeah, you can learn a lot from other people, but if you just swallow the ideas of society, you'll get what we have now, a big mess. <laughs> you know? So you know, because society grows out of desire, actually we get a body because we have desire. But a desire, what's a desire? It's, 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 a, it's a creation. You, know, you can take care of yourself without having lots of desire. So uh, you, you have to reflect back on yourself, but be very careful of any ideas you, you just swallow from society or others. You have to digest it. Otherwise, it's not yours. You're like a robot being controlled by something. And it doesn't matter whether you're left wing, right wing, middle wing, it doesn't matter. It's not yours. And yeah, and um, why, why, why so do you believe that any path is the path we say in buddhism the true way has no gate <laughs> so anything can be the gate but um you know there's the evil paths you know there's the path of i want to kill you <laughs> i wouldn't say that's the path <laughs> there's truly only one path but it can take infinite forms. It's like climbing to the top of the mountain. You can go up the north side, the south side, the east side, the west side. You can go around, around, around. But if you know where, you, if you've got the goal clear, you will get there. Another way to describe this like this, uh, Japanese people eat with chopsticks. Uh, Korean people eat with chopsticks and spoons. Western people eat with knife and a fork, but Indian people just use their hands. So four different techniques, but the direction is the same. Food into my stomach. So if the direction is correct, any path takes you there. 
But if the direction's not correct, every path will lead you the wrong way. So it's not that any path is the path. You have to be clear about the direction. Then everything is the true way. The toilet flushing can give you enlightenment. You know, the dog barking can wake you up. But if you don't have the correct direction, you won't get there, even if you sit in meditation for a billion years. So most important in Buddhism and Zen practice in Tibetan Buddhism too is direction. In Tibetan Buddhism, they say your original nature is the compassionate mind. In Zen, we say, understand my true self and help others. If that's your direction, then many, many techniques, many paths, working, married, single, gay, straight, anything will take you if the direction is clear. So very important is what's your direction. Same thing, knife and fork, your hand, chopsticks is fine if you understand the direction is food into my mouth and my stomach. Otherwise, if you're trying to put it into your ear, even the best food in the world won't help you. So would you say that, because that, that will solve uh, one of the biggest hum, hu, uh, like humanity problems, which is everyone is ser searching for purpose, for drive, for you know, that ultimate passion. Pa passion. So is, that, is, is the, 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 the direction you are talking about, is the just helping the other? Or, or how, how do you... How would you say that other people must or should find this direction and what this direction should be? Well, you just start out by asking them, who are you? And then see what they say. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, you're, you're, um, I've, I've been, um, some, some con uh, there is a concept that really also resonates with me. And uh, this is why I get so hooked with Zen. Um, is because uh, most of the time, like as as my as I advance in life, these recent years, I find more emptiness. But you know, an mm. emptiness that says, you know, you 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 wrong or you are lost. I find like a real tranquil and peaceful and relaxing emptiness. So, and um, you use a term which is we are originally empty. Mm -hmm. So can you, can you explain us? So, because I, I see it, is, is any link between emptiness and fullness or, mm -hmm. or it's the same? Mm. So there's a teaching from the Buddha called the Heart Sutra, and it has four parts. The first part says, Form is emptiness. Emptiness is form. You arise out of emptiness, but now you have a form. Now, before you were born, you're zero. Now, you're one. But when you die, you're again zero. This whole universe, nobody knows where it came from. Okay. Everything just appears out of nothing and then disappears again. That's the nature of form and emptiness. But originally, there's no form, no emptiness, complete stillness. Even the Bible talks about that. Be still, know that I am God. When you become still inside without thought, then you know God. You and God already become one. So first point is form is emptiness, emptiness is form. Everything's impermanent. Everything's changing. Mountains become water. Waters becomes mountain. Originally, no form, no emptiness. So no mountain, no water, no speech, no suffering, nothing at all. That's the absolute, this original nature of things. And we need to realize that in experience. But then form is form, emptiness is emptiness. Life is life, death is death. So things are complete just the way they are. 40 degrees is 40 degrees. I make it hot or cold, okay? For sure. So each thing itself, sky's blue, trees green, each thing itself is complete. So we say there's three worlds then. 
the impermanent world of opposites, form is emptiness, emptiness is form. Mountain is water, water is mountain. Then the absolute world, the original absolute world of total emptiness. So total emptiness means also no emptiness because there's nothing to say empty. So no mountain, no form, no emptiness, no mountain, no water. Then mountain is mountain, water is water. Form is form, emptiness is emptiness, the complete world. So three worlds, opposite world, impermanent world, absolute world, and complete world. Which world's the true world? And Zen style is ha! <laughs> mountains high, waters flowing. When you cut your thinking, you can see moment to moment how each thing functions. Then compassion and wisdom appears. Baby's crying, pick the baby up and help it. Somebody's hungry, give them food. You're hungry, eat. That's the nature of life. So if you attach to any of these ideas, don't get it. But if you cut your thinking for a moment, you can see how things function clearly. Is, is, this, a, is this a result of the, of the illusion of the I and the, and the divided mind? What, what's, what's your views or thoughts or, on, on the illusion of the, the I and also the, the divided mind, which I think uh, the, the, the I is created by the divided mind, right? Well, <laughs> you could say either way, you know, one creates the other, they arise together, whatever. As soon as you engage in opposite thinking, <coughs> you have created, you can call it I, me in the world, you can call it the divided mind. You can call it a, a lot of things. You can call it, uh, in, a, in the world nowadays, we call it success. You know? <laughs> but it's not. It's horrible. So, uh, yeah, the, 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 the point, the turning point that is, uh, you can see in Buddhism is when you create opposite thinking, you create everything, which means you create also suffering. When you take that away, then you see the way through the world that's already here and how to use each thing, not for yourself, for all beings. So he, my teacher, uh, towards the end of his life, he was quite ill. He did very strong training when he was young and became diabetic and he never stopped. He didn't eat meat, which is good for diabetics. He worked very, very hard, constantly was traveling and helping, and he was strong enough to be able to do that. But after a while, diabetes starts to destroy everything. So luckily, I, I chose to spend the last year he was alive with him, with a, a Korean nun and another American monk who had been staying with him, helping him. And it was amazing. He was uh, in his late mid mid 70s, late 70s, to see him adjust from being this very strong person who loved going anywhere in the world into new situations, meeting people, understanding them, and then turning them into Zen students to this, he could only stay in, in the soul and mostly in the temple. But what he did is, I, I mean, I have many stories, somehow he used his sickness and the situation to teach us. And many interesting things happened. Uh, even though I know he was, his body was suffering, but somehow his mind was very clear. He understood us and he was able to use situations as amazing teaching of, uh, you know, uh, to us in, in many simple, simple things. Can and you even like make it Interesting. Can you, can you recall any situation, any, any anecdote? Sure, sure. You know, I mean, he was a very strong person, but because of all his sickness and this mixture of Western medicine and Chinese medicine, uh, he started to get diarrhea towards the end of his life. And so he'd be in a chair in his room. We got this nice chair for him. And then if he had to go, we'd help him go to the bathroom, but because he couldn't walk so well. 
but sometimes you're too late. Then the three of us would help him get undressed. The other monk and I would hold him up in the bathtub and the nun would hose him down and clean him. And then we'd help him dry off and dress and he'd lay down. So one time I'm in the room with him, just the two of us. And suddenly he says to me, oh, bathroom, necessary. So I take his arm and we're walking to the bathroom. And partway there, I hear him explode, you know. And he looks at me, it was so interesting because I'm the new, new helper out of the three of us. And now it's just the two of us. And I saw him turn and look at me and it was just like an X-ray machine. He was 100% Zen master. <laughs> he like totally read my mind. He was checking to see, am I checking? Am I thinking, oh, this old man, now I'm going to have to clean him up. What a bummer or what? And I wasn't at all. My feeling, my thought was, well, I guess it's just you and me to, to do this, you know? And I, it was so cool because, like, he suddenly wasn't the guy who just shit in his pants. He was Zen master, you know, <laughs> for me. <laughs> so we had many things like that, you know, where uh, he was great. He was great. Even when he was having a hard time, he was, uh, and so natural about it that he was uh, quite aware always of who was there and what we were doing and understanding us and what might help us. And uh, it, was, it was quite amazing. It was a great year, uh, even though I feel bad for him because he, my feeling was he kept his body going as long as possible until he couldn't anymore and felt okay, we can take care of ourselves. And now that's probably what most parents do. They want to stay alive until they feel like their kids can do it on their own. You know, it's beautiful. Wow. I do believe he had the power to just sit up and die if he wanted to. But that wasn't his way. Uh, and it wouldn't have helped us. The way he did it helped us. How did you, how did you meet uh, Sung San? I mean, I, uh, was it had in your life, but you were talking about the toilet, so I need to stop for a second. <laughs> no problem! Sorry for interrupting you, and uh, I'm going to leave it that way because I think is, this is Buddha nature in perfect nature, right? Thank Absolutely. you so much. You're welcome. So uh, you asked, uh, how did I meet Sung San Um After I stopped working in uh, psychology and gave up the idea of either uh, becoming a therapist or a medical doctor, I needed to do something to support myself. And I got interested in pottery and I started studying pottery and I realized I'm not a potter and I was running out of money. So I saw a sign 
that said uh, the American government would pay for your welding school if you work for them for a year or something. And so I signed up. I think I was 25 and I uh, learned to weld and I got a job, but it was very strange. I got a job working in a nuclear submarine factory. It was building nuclear submarines and uh, my friends were all becoming lawyers and PhDs and I was building a weapon. And it was shortly after the Vietnam War had ended. And so, you know, my friends were sort of like, uh, what are you doing, you know? But I, I just, uh, I worked in a factory with 10,000 people. I think I met one guy who had gone to university. Most of them had been soldiers in Vietnam, the young guys. And uh, everybody was working class. It was great. I had a really fascinating year, but I got this big question, like, what the hell am I doing with it? Like, I'm building a, a weapon, you know? And uh, during that time, I strongly decided I want to find a Buddhist teacher. So I started to drive on the weekends. I was living in New England. There's only two places in America that make submarines, and the main one is up in New England. And uh, it was so interesting, though. I was living, I was 25. I was living with a guy who was 20 and his 16-year-old girlfriend who had run away from home. I had never had any sisters, so now I had this little sister who was so funny and interesting. And uh, anyway, I start looking around, and I hear about a Zen center in Rhode Island. So I drove up there one Sunday. And the master wasn't there. I knew nothing about the master. But I did the chanting with them, and I sort of enjoyed it, you know. Uh, it was Korean, and uh, so I even liked it because I didn't understand it. It was just like making sound, and it felt good. It was one teaching in English we chanted, and then somebody gave a talk, and it was very simple. Didn't seem to have any dogmas. She was telling that she was a nurse in an old age home, and she was telling about how one of the patients, she went to peel a banana, and we always peel it from one end. But then the, this old man said to her, no, don't peel it from that end, peel it from the other. And she said, no, no, we always peel it from this end. And he said, monkeys peel it from the other end. I saw it on TV. And she did that, and it was really easy. You know? So she was just talking about, how you can just learn something every single moment, you know, every day. So I thought, well, that's pretty stupid. It's okay. There's no weirdness there. Then I decided two months later to go to one of their branch centers, which was closer to where I lived. And again, the teacher wasn't there. There were some students and they gave a talk after the evening meditation. And then I asked one of them to teach me to sit and he taught me. And so then at home, I get up early and I sit for like 15 minutes and I sit in the evening and uh, the master was coming to that center in two weeks. He would give a talk and then lead a three day retreat. So I decided to do that and I signed up for it like you did. And so, uh, and that whole process was interesting, you know, many levels interesting. Uh, and anyway, I got there and Sun Sun had been in America about four and a half years and he spoke a kind of broken English that was pretty good since when he first came to America, he spoke no ling English at all. And his style was to have one of his students give a 20 minute talk, then he answered questions for like an hour, hour and 10 minutes. So it was more interesting than him giving a lecture. So that time, some professor, I think, asked him, what is sanity? What is insanity? And he didn't know those English words. So his student told him, this man asked, what is crazy? What is not crazy? He understood those words. So then he said, if you're very attached to something, you're very crazy. If you're a little attached to something, you're a little crazy. If you're not attached to anything, that's not crazy. Then I remember thinking, that's better than my 10 years of studying and working in psychology. Because it means even a rich businessman, even a religious person, if they're attached, they're crazy. Even if everybody says they're a great person, they're successful. Even a 
even a homeless person or a taxi cab driver, if they're not attached, they're not crazy. It's just that point. But he continued talking and he said, so in this world, everybody's crazy because everybody's attached to I, but this I doesn't exist. It's just made by our thinking. If you don't want to attach to your thinking I, but realize your true nature, you must practice Zen. So then I realized uh, that's my teacher. And uh, then during the three-day retreat, it was hard. It was about nine hours a day of sitting and some bowing and chanting, keeping silence. We also got to see the teacher privately each day, and he gave us some teaching. And the first day, he gave me a basic teaching. And I, I know the whole thing by heart. I can do it very quickly, but it takes a few minutes. But basically what he was saying is, your, your true substance is before thinking. So your, your before thinking substance, my before thinking substance, somebody's before thinking substance. Then he held up a stick. He said, this stick substance, the substance of the sun, the moon, the stars, all universal substance is the same substance. Then I had a thought that surprised me. At that moment, this thought appeared in my mind. I've been waiting my whole life to hear that. And that was it. I, I just became a student right there. And uh, six weeks later, after two more retreats, I quit my job and I went to live in the Zen Center. And uh, another thing he did that was really great is the third day, at the end of the private teaching, he looked at me and he said, do you have any more questions? And I suddenly, I was 26, but I was suddenly like a four-year-old boy. And I said, when will I see you again? And he took his stick and he slammed me on the leg. And I was shocked, you know. And I was just like, and then he leaned forward and looked at me very nicely in the eyes. And he said, when you keep don't know mine, you and I are never separate. So it's not even about a particular person, don't know mind. When we have don't know mind, even your father or mother has died, you're not separate. If you don't keep your, if you keep your opinion, even if they're sitting next to you, you're separate. Thank you for the story. Um, you're so very welcome. You touched um, um, an interesting and really key point, which is, attachment and attachment and the attachment because I have have very have, um, have watching some of your talks also so what's the difference and how how can people get rid of the attachment or what's the trap of an attachment we because I've, I've hear you I've hearing you and watching you talking about it's better to de attach that than to be unattached right it's not bad. It just leads to suffering. But on another hand, for a baby, if a baby and the mother don't get attached, the baby will grow up screwed up. So uh, that's a little different story. But, um, you know, in Southern Buddhism, they talk about detach. But we don't talk that way. We say, when you're doing something, just do it. Then you and the situation become one. And things become clear. And if it's a, you know, when some people tell me they hate their job, sometimes I tell them, work harder. Because what happens is some people, if, if they really concentrate and do their job with more concentration, one of two things happens. Either they realize every job has some shit to it. Every job does. I just... But what was dissatisfying was I wasn't trying hard. Or they realized they really do hate the job and they quit. How many times are people in a relationship thinking, ah, oh, we should break up. No, you know, maybe I shouldn't. Maybe I should. Maybe I shouldn't. And then 20 years later, oh, I should have broken up. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so we say, just do what you're doing and it will become clear by itself. But that's sometimes painful because we attach to things and everything will disappear at some point. 
But if you just do it, that time, really just do it, your body, your mind and the situation become one, then things become clear. So for example, one time a student asked Zen Master Sun Tzu, some boy sees a woman and with a pocketbook. He grabs the pocketbook and runs. He just does it. And Sun Tzu said, no, no, that's not just do it. He already has opposite thinking. I want that. Just do it has no opposites. So I tell people, uh, you know, when I give talks, who here washes dishes? Who washes dishes? You know, and I say, when you're washing dishes, what are you thinking about? You know, with Korean women, it's really easy. My husband's no good. My children are no good. They don't appreciate me. In the temple, it's the same. When I was a very young person, I'd be washing too, and I think. The cook is no good. Why do they make a mess like this? And the house master's no good. The abbot's no good. The Zen master's really full of shit. That's not the way to wash dishes. When you wash dishes, just do it. You know, washing dishes is like a, it's like a kung fu. It's a martial art. Stand with your feet shoulder width apart. Bend your knees slightly. Drop your butt to the ground and wash dishes. Then what happens is you see the water come out. You feel it. You don't need to think, oh, here's the water coming out. Oh, I'm feeling it. This is so wonderful. Do it. Just do it. All this stuff becomes clear by itself. And then, you know, I really learned something. It's magic. We turn the faucet, the water comes out. We turn it this way, it stops. Unbelievable. I tell people in Korea, 70 years ago, your grandma was carrying water if she could find water at all. What do you do? Sometimes I used to stand in the bathroom in my room. It's amazing. Turn, water comes out. Turn, it stops. Then I tell people, your grandchildren aren't going to be able to do that. When the world falls apart, they're going to be carrying water again. So appreciate what you have right now. You know, 70 years ago in Korea, whole countries destroyed. But people now say, my life's so stressful. You know, I only have two cars. You know, it's like, we don't understand this, what life is. So we get so upset with our situation. If you really want a bad situation, go to Syria, you know, go someplace that's complete screwed up hell. Then you understand what a real bad situation is. If you just do what you're doing, you see that the everyday things in life can be wonderful. And it's not the things, it's your attention and involvement and presence with what you're doing. So I tell people in Korea, don't think about your kitchen sink as just some more obligation. It's your meditation. When you're doing something, just do it. That name is Zazen, okay? okay? It doesn't matter whether you're sitting, washing dishes, talking to your kid, driving your car, anything, just do it. Then if it's coming from a screwed up idea, you'll get the result. <laughs> <laughs> then you'll then you might decide to change <laughs> but so we don't talk about detachment okay and then you see when you just do it you're not so attached so when it's time to die die <laughs> the hard part is the leading up to it so but then realize if you can say okay now this body's going to fall apart then that's what happens. What are your, what are your teachings and uh, life experience on eliminating, eliminating pleasure and suffering? When you're doing something pleasurable, do it! <laughs> <laughs> if you do it 100%, you won't want more. It'll be fine already. And then when it's the correct time to do it, do something else, you'll do it and you'll enjoy it. And when you have to suffer, you suffer. I have a story about that too. I don't know if you want so many little stories, but yes, please. Uh, 
when I was working, the, la the last time, one of the times when I was working in the mental hospital, there was a big fight <laughs> and some guy broke my nose. Then I decided not to get it fixed. So um, about 25 years later, I'm a monk in Korea, sleeping in a room with an American monk friend. And in the morning, he says to me, you know, your breathing's not so good at night. And I said, well, my nose broke, you know, 25 years ago, and I can't get air on one side. So he's, so then he told Sun Santin, and then Sun Santin says to me, your nose is not the correct working? I said, well, this side, no air. So he goes, soon, fix. Okay, he told me you could fix it. So I went to the hospital. I had an operation. I'm in a room, you know, and it's, it's, it, it was great. I've had, you know, I never had an operation before. So they knock you out and they do stuff with your nose. And, but when they do your nose, they yeah. shove all this I did stuff. A, I did an operation too in the nose. Yeah. Actually, it's a small thing, but it's a pain in the neck, pain in the ass, a pain in the nose. It hurts. So yeah. one night I can't sleep and it's killing me. Yeah. And you got all this junk stuffed up there. So I asked the nurse, she gives me a shot and I go to heaven. You know? I guess this is why people die from painkillers. It was nice, you know? So I sleep really well. The next day the pain comes, they give me another shot. That night the pain comes and the, late, the nurse looks at her watch and says, can't have one till tomorrow morning. <laughs> so I'm laying in bed and it's eight o'clock and nine o'clock and 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock and 12 o'clock. So I'm not happy. So I decide I'm going to walk around the hospital unit with my little pole with some bag that's plugged into my arm. And I'm going to do a mantra. So I'm walking around until like three in the morning and I'm chanting the great Dharanic. Like that over and over and over again. Still hurts. Three hours later. So I go to the TV room and I decide I'm going to turn on the TV and then maybe I'll forget about how much it hurts. But there's a little sign. I can read a little Korean. There's a sign in Korean. It says no TV midnight to 7 a.m. So I'm like, shit. <laughs> so I'm sitting in this chair at 3 a.m. And I'm doing the mantra. My nose hurts like hell. And I think to myself, my practice isn't working. Okay. It hurts. But then I think that's ridiculous. Practice's purpose isn't to take away pain, it's to take away suffering. So the pain is just pain. So then I realize I have nothing to really complain about. Yeah, it hurts, but my situation isn't serious. I'm going to get over this, get out of the hospital. There's people in the hospital now, they have more pain. They have less pain, but they're dying. Their situation is bad. Mine is nothing. It hurts. That's all. So then I realized my practice is fine. Chanting the great Dharani, sitting in the hospital, and my nose hurts. That's clear. So suffering isn't pain. Suffering is I don't want this pain. How, how this is related to to oneself because um, if, I, if I remember well, um, there is a saying you, you were, um, let me quote you, uh, or, or, or not sure if it were you, but I've heard in, in, in somewhere that the key to learn about yourself is to forget yourself. I think you say- oh, this is, right? yeah, yeah. I didn't say that, but that's a famous saying from uh, Japanese Buddhism, Dogen. Exactly. Uh, to uh, something like to understand the self is to study the self. To study the self is to forget the self. To exactly. forget the self is to be enlightened by all things. So what does that mean? It means in this room, the wall's white. You're not making I. And the world comes clear. So in, in the hospital, when I stopped making this, I don't want this pain, my practice isn't working, what became clear is my situation's not that bad. There's others who have a 
bad situation. I just have some pain, it'll go away. So the pain is pain, that's all. And it was tolerable, you know. So then you're enlightened by the world. The same thing with the water. We don't realize that we can, in our own house, get water. How many humans, for how many, how many have ever been able to do that? That's a treasure right there. And if we lose it, we'll adapt, you know? So we lose all these wonderful things and the appreciation of it, wanting some stupid other thing that we swallowed from somebody else. You know, I don't have enough uh, hits on my YouTube channel or, you know, all the stupid stuff with clothes. One nice thing about being a monk is you wear the same color every day. It's not that interesting and you never think about it. You know, today was so funny. I had this, uh, this, this uh, young college student and her mother and brother come to visit me. And she showed me a picture and she was all dressed up. And I said, wow, you can be quite elegant. And she said, well, I'm just wearing my pajamas today. And I said, that's all I wear every day. I'm always wearing my pajamas. <laughs> so we have to be careful what we swallow. It's not society's fault. They're just doing their desire thing, you know. But we have to be aware of what we take in and some of it comes from ideas that we've been carrying forever, you know, that we made up. Uh, it's like this. Even if you eat good food, healthy food, vegan food, if you don't digest it, it'll become rotten and make you sick. Even if you eat not good food, but you digest it, break it down into its energy things, it'll become fresh energy. The same thing, any idea, any emotion isn't good or bad. If you digest it, it will turn into the true way, you know, into compassion, wisdom, peace, everything. But even a good idea, if you don't digest it, will become rotten and make a problem. And how you and then you'll and then you'll do stupid things. And how you how you digest it? What am I? <laughs> <coughs> Another way to say that is, what is this? And um, you were, when we began the, conver the conversation, you, were, you asked something. Uh, you, you said that uh, the, big, the big question. Um, can you can you tell us the the, the importance? Because um, as I've been reading Zen, I've seen that Zen is about questions. It's about questioning. It's about questions. So what, what what's the what's the relationship between Zen and the big question and the and the questions and all about question everything, right? Well, I'm saying right, but uh, I I don't think it's right. So. What's the relation without the without the right? <laughs> because <laughs> right is like assuming or saying is that true? Um, but, but it's not true or not. But or not. Yeah, yeah, not true. Well, the the path is to uh, have a big question. You know, what is this? That's actually the human path. Uh, you see, animals are wonderful because they're very simple, but animals are very narrow. So they only understand their own situation. A mouse, a, a cat only thinks about a mouse uh, when it's hungry. Then the mouse is food. If it's not hungry, they don't care about it. So they don't really concern themselves with the mouse's situation, just with their situation. So uh, tigers understand tiger's situation. They don't care about elephant situation and so forth. That's an animal mind. But the humans can't, I don't know why, humans can understand everything. A human can connect with an elephant mind and connect with the tiger mind and teach the elephant to let the tiger ride on its back. 
That never happens in nature. So humans have a unique ability to understand everything. The problem in the world now is humans are behaving like animals. We only want to understand my group. We don't care about other people's group. And it's happening in politics, in religion, in social life, in family life, and even inside our own consciousness. My, my judgment mind and my desire mind, my opinion mind are all fighting each other. And then we become screwed up and crazy or we do things that cause suffering for ourselves and others. And just going to the last part of the interview, because I would love to have a round two in, uh, in, 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 a, in, a, in a near time or uh, in a future, because I have so many questions. Um, from your experience, um, and from your teachings and the learnings you've received and the people that's gone through your life and every student you had, how to lead a better life? You have to ask yourself about yourself. You have to look back at yourself, reflect on yourself and, uh, and, uh, and don't make judgments. Be very careful about blaming. You've got to get rid of this mind that blames. Don't blame others. Don't blame yourself. You have to recognize that when you're blaming, there's something you're not doing correctly. So nowadays, one of the big diseases humans have is too many opinions and blaming mind. Eh, too many people want to think I am a victim of something else. Now, white people in America, I'm the victim. Of course, the history is they made everybody else the victim for a long time. But now I'm the victim. I'm being discriminated against. And the result will be disaster. So reflect back on yourself. If you do, take away your judgment mind. Take away your, uh, all your opinions. Just experience sensation as it is. And then naturally you'll begin to see what's important and what's not. This pandemic will help many people because so many of the things we get involved in are unnecessary, but everything got reduced down. Some people won't learn anything, but a lot of people will learn what's really important. And they will start to put more time in it. Also, some people will learn We have to live together with nature. We don't control nature. Of course, if humans don't learn that, mostly we'll disappear. There's no reason why the universe doesn't need us. And the earth doesn't need us. You know, there's many comedians who are very good about that when they talk about it. So actually, you know, meditation means to stop for and just look at what's, look at myself, look what's happening. What am I experiencing this moment? And slowly, slowly, you can begin to experience more clearly. And then you un begin to understand what's important, what's not important. It takes time. And this pandemic has caused humans a little bit to slow down and to look at those things. You get idiots like the president of my country who only thinks about his own personal situation and the economics. And of course you create a bigger disaster. And he, not only him, everybody does it in their own way. For some ridiculous reason, 62 million people put him in a power position and America is getting the result of that. But um, <laughs> no. <laughs> you know, it's very interesting. In general, the countries run by women are handling the pandemic much better. It's, it's not to say that women are any better than men, but right now they're doing a better job. So, hey, let's share. Let's nice you know, share. Sure. Yeah. In Korea, I always say, woman power going up, man power going down. So I tell the men, relax. Let them 
Enjoy the ride. Let them try. Yeah. And then we can do more meditation. So who knows? Why, 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 so, medita why meditation is good for nothing? And, and so people, is, people get so stuck. Um, I, I run some courses on disruptive education around the country, outside. And when people come to the meditation part, they never, they, never know, they never know how to do it. So first question is, why is it for nothing? And second, if anyone, is, if anyone is listening or watching this podcast or after video, how can have a good start? Let's put it that way. Let's put it that way. Cats know how to meditate. Dogs know how to meditate. Frogs know how to meditate. Flies know how to meditate. Mosquitoes know how to meditate. Humans know how to meditate. We don't do it because we're so filled with desire. You know, all you have to do is stop what you're doing. That's why we sit. It's the simplest activity. Just sit. When you, Buddha said very simply, when you breathe in, know that you're breathing in. When you breathe out, know that you're breathing out. All joy comes from really being in the present moment. But we are not patient. And so we've created so many things that we think will bring us joy. But all you have to do is sit still and you can find joy just in being. But we, we don't do it. You know, the Chinese have a saying, how unfortunate to live in an interesting age. Well, we live in a very interesting age, which means our energy is always going out in what we want. We want other people's attention. We want this. We want that. We want justice. We want good things, bad things. It doesn't matter. Unless people slow down, begin to reflect, find you know, start to come back to themselves. If we do that, you can begin to see what's worthwhile, what's not, what you can do and what you can't do moment to moment. And then you'll find your way, whether the situation outside is good or bad, doesn't matter. One time my teacher said, the outside world will never give you peace, equality, and freedom. If you want peace, equality, and freedom, you must look inside. Even Christianity said that. I think Jesus said, the kingdom of God is within. But why is everybody thinking it's, out, it's outside someplace and then getting into fights that somebody has a different idea? <laughs> and, why is good, and why meditation is good for nothing? What do you mean good for nothing? You mean it doesn't cost anything? No, it's just uh, I, 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 it's believed or I heard that that the the when you understand meditation, you understand that it's good for nothing, because you sit and you don't pay attention about anything else. Oh well, I'm not sure exactly what that means, but um, uh, that's not true. Uh, you know, not at all. And it's and if somebody becomes attached to meditation, to sitting meditation, they will also have a problem. Mm -hmm. so that's uh, that, it's, uh, that's why it's helpful to practice together with others. Then a natural balance appears. And you know, we we're very involved with other people. I've been living with thousands of people for forty three years. You know, so uh, even uh, well, partly because I chose to follow a monk who also. Although deep inside, he really uh, got home, you could say. He was very involved with other people in the world. And I like that. I wanted to become clear and help. And first, my mind was politics during college. And then I saw politics is a good path, but everybody's angry. And everybody has opposite thinking. It wasn't my path. Then I tried psychology. And then I found Buddhism, and I feel like by going, making practice available, people come and go, if it helps their life, and they're living, raising kids, or having jobs. One of Sun Sun Sanin's students is a senator of the United States. One student I remember asked Sun Sanin, 
is being a monk the only way I can help the world? Something you say, no, you must become president of the United States. <laughs> so, you know, something he was great because he'd always shoot for the top. You know, <laughs> you want to be a lay person? Good, become president. <laughs> So, you know, only somebody who really, it's better if they don't do anything, they can sit all the time. <laughs> how, how, can we, how can we reach Buddha nature? What, what do you see in front of you right now? I see you. I see a person. Me? Actually, you see the screen of your computer. Oh, okay, <laughs> Be clear. <laughs> you see my projection on the screen of your computer. See clear, hear clear, act clear. That is Buddha nature. And um, last but not least, um, what would what if you have to name a few of your of the key, key learnings you've reached in your life, or you you've, the the key lessons you you learned in your life? What would be that lessons? Try. Try. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, there was a Tibetan, famous Tibetan yogi named Milarepa about 800 years ago. And when he was an old man, uh, somebody, his students also asked him that. And of course, his practice was sitting a lot in a cave. And he got up, pulled his pants down, and you could see the rough part on his butt, the callus from all the sitting. Um, well, his teaching was sit, but our teaching is try, whatever your situation is. And uh, our teacher used to sign his letters, I hope you only go straight, don't know. Try, try, try for 10,000 years nonstop. Realize, attain your Buddha nature and save all beings from suffering. So I used to hear that and think, 10,000 years, oh my God. <laughs> you know? Tonight is hard enough. <laughs> Try. You know, we also used to say Dharma is seven times fall down, eight times get up. Seven times. You know, uh, I saw somebody said recently, uh, some, you know, some lady who does exercise on YouTube, she said, a failure isn't falling down. It's not getting back up. That's true. <laughs> Amen. It's cool. Yeah, amen. So it's so beautiful because it's not dependent on gender, sexuality, country, culture, language. It's just human. Um, yeah. And I like that Zen can cut through that. Now, you mentioned Zen and Taoism, so I want to tell you one thing my teacher said. Please. And then maybe you'll, you'll appreciate this. He said, Indian Buddhism went to China and met Chinese Taoism. They got married and had a baby which is Zen. Mm, really so when you're studying Zen, you're studying the do it part of, uh, of Taoism. The yeah, this is, what, this is, it makes sense because it's more actionable and more like yeah. tangible, yeah. right? Yeah, uh, the, the, the Taoism part, you read it, it's wonderful philosophy, but wonderful. how do you make it your, your body, your cells? How do you do it? I always say that I'm 100% action. So this is why it's resonating with me so, so strong. And yeah. I have just a, a few rapid fire questions. The first okay. one is, what you who you recommend me to interview next? Oh, wow. <laughs> I mean, the first thing I thought of was uh, Bobby Rhodes, who is the head Zen master in our school. She's an American woman and lives in... California. Uh, oh, I'm not quite you. sure why, but that just popped into my head. Bobby Rose. Yeah, Bobby Rose. I can send you her email address. Okay, thank you. Uh, what's Inca? What is Inca? Um, uh, when the king would make some uh, rule, they would put a copy of it next to each other and they would take a seal and they pressed the seal half on one, half on the other. And that proved that it was real. So Inca literally means seal. 
So it's just a teacher seal that you attained my teaching and you are carrying it on. What's the, what's the biggest, what's the thing you, you feel most proud of? Um, agreeing to do this interview. <laughs> <laughs> what's, um, what's in your agenda? My agenda? <laughs> uh, go to sleep after a little while. It's about, what time is it? It's, it's not quite nine o'clock. Here we finish the meditation at nine and get up at four. So probably soon go to sleep. That's all. If you were, if you were about to, to, to set up a, a new school in any part of the, the world, where it, will, where it will be? I think I'd learn a lot if I went to Africa somewhere. Mm. What's the, what's the, what's, what's been your biggest failure? <laughs> being born. <laughs> and, uh, and one memory that you've never forget. You never forget. I don't really have hardly any memories. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> well, the two that flashed into my mind was seeing this Buddhist statue at Kamakura when I was 11. And uh, Sung San Sim hitting me on the leg when I asked him, when will I see you again? <laughs> what was the book you, you read the most or you recommended the most? Sky's blue, trees green. You won't find it in any library. No? You have to go outside. Okay. <laughs> ah, okay, okay, okay. Got it, got it. <laughs> got it, got it. <laughs> um, any, any personal recommendation you want to, you want any, no, now is, I always say, ignore all non-requested recommendations, but now I'm requesting you a recommendation for everyone who is uh, listening to this podcast for any recommendation for them? Yeah, uh, five or 10 minutes every day, sit down on the floor if you like, in a chair if you like, and just try to be aware of your breath coming in and coming out. And uh, any thoughts, any feelings, just let them be like clouds coming and going. And, uh, and put your attention in your lower belly because that's human beings original energy center. When we're inside our mom, that's our body's energy center. When we're born, it moves up here. And then around one or two years old, it moves here, opposite thinking. Then many problems appear. If your energy comes down, even if you get knocked over, but your energy's down, you can come back up. If your energy's up high and you get knocked over, very hard to come back up. So breathe in, breathe out, relax, pay attention. And once in a while, you can ask yourself, what is this? Don't worry about an answer. Just ask and pay attention. And Breathe. Last but until you die. <laughs> I recommend that. Keep breathing until you die. <laughs> and now if you, had the, if you have the chance to be in a, Now imagine that I'm a Time, Time Magazine reporter and I'm say, Dai Bon Sunim, you, Master da, ma, say Master Dai Bon Sunim, you are going to be featured in the Time Magazine um, cover. So what mm. message would you, would, you, would you want to appear in this co magazine cover in Time? No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. Is there, is there anything else you want to add? I really like Muhammad Ali. He's my favorite athlete from, the, uh, from my lifetime. And uh, uh, one time he said, uh, and everybody in the world knows him, maybe some young people don't. But one time he said, and you know, he had great, great talent. 
but he practiced hard. And uh, he said many interesting things, but he said, the fight isn't won the night of the fight in the ring. It's won in the practice room. So just try moment to moment. And if we find out how to use our mind the right way, then every one of our situations can become a beneficial practice, even our everyday life completely. And as, you, as we are virtually and you don't have a stick, I can ask you this question. Where I will see you again? <laughs> <laughs> I hit you 30 times. What do you say? <laughs> ouch! <laughs> Virtual ouch! <laughs> Thank you so much. Where, um, where people can find you? Can find you in the internet? Can find you through Musangsa? Where people can know more about you and find you or your work on the internet in their nose <laughs> they can find me in their nose <laughs> breathe in breathe out <laughs> okay i'll see you there <laughs> thank you so much okay you're, you're welcome it's been a pleasure thank you so much you're welcome and thank you and, and yeah. good luck with the, everything you do thank sounds you. like you do great stuff thanks thank for inviting you. me I'm blessed okay Take care all. Bye-bye. Stay well. Bye. Peace, love. <laughs> well, you've, uh, you've listened in a, an interview that I wanted to, to hold for, for some time. We, we've been in conversations to, to hold this, this, this interview. And uh, you've listened to Sam Master Daibon Sunim. If you want to learn more about him, you can find him in Musangsa. I've, I've, I, will, uh, I will leave the links on the show notes and uh, just take at least one thing you find useful, just one thing and action. And as, as Tabon Sunim said, just try, 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 try. And you don't have to wait 10,000 years. Just try now. <laughs> we have in, and we're living in the best and most interesting moment of our lives. We have more chances, more opportunities, more resources than our grandfathers, than our fathers and mothers, than our previous family that comes before. Don't waste this lifetime opportunity. Just make it count and sit, sit, sit. It's a great, great start. Just try and go all the way. And as Toy Story say, to the, infin to the infinite, and beyond because if you don't disrupt yourself you're being disrupted and this will be more painful go ahead and live live life and enjoy and help others this is disrupt everything podcast series and i'm isra garcia <laughs>